no, the thumbnail is not clickbait. This is a project that you can do complete with a set of free drawings. There will be a link for you to download a set of these for yourself somewhere in the description down below. So what's the point? Why should you bother? Who is this for? Well, machining and I guess just making things in general can of course be a lot of fun and hugely gratifying. And there's a lot that you can learn from watching videos, reading books. As a matter of fact, this very project was stolen out of the first book that I ever read on how to run a manual lathe. But like anything worth doing, in order to be good at it requires practice. And that is the point of this project and this video. To get you and me out into the shop practicing those fundamental skills and techniques of manual lathe work on the way to becoming better machinists. And the very best part is that by the end of this, you will have a tool to put in your toolbox that you can use on future projects, hopefully for years to come. So I guess with that out of the way, let me tell you about what we're gonna be making and the tools and materials that you'll need to make it. All right, what we are making is basically a set of small hole gauges. I guess you could call them pin gauges as well. The set consists of a handle, which also doubles as the smallest two gauges. The quarter inch gauge is this small section out on the end here, and then the 3 8 gauge is right behind it. As well as, of course, the gauges themselves. The drawings that I'm providing only give you a single sample gauge and its dimensions. However, all of the dimensions will remain exactly the same for all of the gauges, save for the major diameter, which of course will change depending on what size gauge you're making. As far as what sizes to make, you can make whatever sizes you want. I am just going to make a set of gauges in 1 8 inch increments, starting with quarter inch and then going up to basically as big as my stock will allow. Which brings us of course to the stock or materials that you're going to need. I do recommend using something decent for this, something with some toughness, especially if you want these to last. 4140 pre-hard might be a good choice if you have it. Personally, I'm just going to be using this 1144 stress proof for the handle. And for the gauges themselves, I'll be using this nasty old pitted piece of mystery steel. Like I just said, I do recommend using something decent if you have it. I am just using these because they're what I have on hand. Right now, I'm just not really in a position to be buying a lot of stock, so I'm using what I have. And let me address this here because I just know that I'm going to get comments about it. Sure, it would be great if these were hardened. However, the ability to harden and accurately grind cylindrical parts is not something that I expect most hobbyists to have in their shop, so it's definitely not going to be a part of this project. As far as the tooling needed, it's mostly pretty basic stuff. Aside from basic turning tools, of course a parting and grooving tool will be used. It can be nice to have a couple of different size options for this, a thicker and thinner option. However, that's not strictly necessary. Any parting and grooving tool will do just fine. I do highly recommend having a well-honed, really sharp piece of either brazed carbide or high-speed steel. This just helps make some of the finish turning a lot easier, especially when it comes to hitting those really close tolerances. Again, this isn't strictly necessary, but it is a technique that I'm going to be using and demonstrating in this video. And finally, I guess the only what you might call specialty tool that I'm going to be using is this eighth inch radius tool that I ground from high speed steel. It just has an outside eighth inch radius on one end and an inside eighth inch radius on the other. Again, not necessary. This is purely aesthetic. I just thought that radiuses would look nice for a couple of features on the handle, but chamfers will work just as well. All right, I think I've monologued at you long enough for one video. So let's get started on this project. Because the handle is the biggest and most complicated part, I want to start with that. So the handle is essentially made up of two main sections. There is the front section, which I'm calling the stem. This front section is two inches long and contains the two most critical dimensions. So this is what I'm going to start with. I'm 
I am coming up on the first critical dimension now. I need to take this section here down to 3 eighths of an inch and the rear part of this section is going to serve as the 3 eighths inch gauge in our pin gauge set. So the tolerance that I'm shooting for on this section is pretty close. I would like to hit plus zero minus maybe a couple of tenths if I can. And so I want to take a quick second to just talk about the tool that I'm going to be using as well as the method that I plan on using to hit these close dimensions. First up, as far as the tool's concerned, there really isn't anything special about it. The only thing that matters is that it's honed to a nice sharp edge and that there is a nice gentle radius on the cutting tip. The real trick here is in how I'll be dialing in my cut depth. Instead of using the cross slide like I normally would, I'll be using my compound to dial in my depth of cut. First, I'll set my compound to six degrees off of the axis of the spindle. This is almost parallel with the spindle. So why six degrees? Well, you've probably already guessed it, but like most things in the shop, it all comes down to a little bit of simple trigonometry. By setting my compound at six degrees, or really any angle in relation to the axis of the spindle, essentially what I'm doing is magnifying the scale on my compound by the sine of that angle. So the sine of six degrees is 0.1. So if you take one one thousandth of an inch and multiply it by 0.1, you get one ten thousandth of an inch, which essentially means that I am magnifying the scale of my compound by a magnitude of 10. So now I can control my depth of cut accurately to a resolution of one ten thousandth of an inch. And this is why we need the sharp tool, because without a sharp tool, cuts this light just aren't going to work. The tool's just going to rub. Okay, so now you know the general technique that I'm going to be using to hit these close tolerances. From here, the overall strategy is really just to take my time and try not to overshoot it. I'll start out by taking a very light establishing cut, maybe five thousandths, and this is just to set a zero point for my tool and to get my initial starting diameter. From there, I'll begin by infeeding using the cross slide, just like normal, until I get to maybe the last four or five thousandths over my target diameter. At that point, I will switch to the compound, which is of course gonna give me much finer control like we just discussed. And the chips coming off of those last few cuts should look more like powder or grinding dust than chips. If those are the chips we're getting, then we know that the tool is working and should hopefully allow me to sneak up on that target diameter and hit my tolerance of plus zero minus one or two tenths. Now I need to clean up this back corner here because this back face actually sets the length for both this 3 8 section here as well as the quarter inch section that'll be in front of it. And that's where this eighth inch radius tool comes in. The size of this radius is completely arbitrary. I just chose eighth inch because I thought it would look good. But really the size doesn't matter. The only thing that's important is that there's a radius in this back corner here so that there isn't a stress point right at the base of the stem. All right, I've already marked out the length of this 3 8 section here. That's one inch from this back face here. You can see my line in the blue ink. Next, I need to turn down this quarter inch section for the quarter inch gauge up front here. But before I do that, we need to talk about this itty bitty little tapered section that's gonna sit right in between the quarter inch gauge and the 3 8 gauge. It'll sit right about here. I'm mentioning this now because this little tapered section is actually how your gauges are going to attach to the handle. Your gauges will have a hole right through the middle of them and they'll attach to this little tapered section via a friction fit. For this reason, the size of the hole that you put through the gauges will determine the size of this taper. I hope that makes sense because <laughs> that's all I have to say about that. I will leave a note in the drawings to make sure that you don't forget about it. Okay. 
Moving on to the handle, none of these dimensions are really critical. So whatever looks and I guess feels right is perfectly fine. I am going to switch to collets to hold on to the stem simply because I don't want to mar it up with the chuck jaws. Now, the drawing calls for three inches in length at five eighths diameter for this handle. So that's what I'm gonna go with here. There are also some decorative grooves in the middle and I'm gonna to attempt to add a knurled pattern to mine as well. But like I said, anything that looks and feels good will work just fine. It's just a handle after all. I'm gonna do the knurl first, of course, so that I don't just mush the grooves into oblivion. And to be honest, knurls also always kind of make me a little bit nervous. I don't know, it just feels like they're the perfect opportunity for something to go horribly wrong, I guess. Okay, the last thing that I wanna do for the handle is to put a nice radius on this back corner here. And to do that, I'm gonna be using this high-speed steel radius tool that I talked about earlier. Again, a chamfer would be completely fine here. I just thought that a radius would look nice, so that's what I'm gonna do. And that's all there is to it. The handle is now done. It looks pretty decent, I think. I'll tell you one thing, that knurled grip has got some, well, grip to it. Go ahead, try and pull that out of my... So with that done, all that's left now is the gauges. And honestly, these are really straightforward, so I think we're gonna breeze through this pretty quick. Okay, so like I just mentioned, these things are pretty straightforward. It's basically just a cylinder with a hole through it, so I won't spend a lot of time talking about this. But I will make just a couple of quick notes. First off, you're going to see that I am drilling and reaming this central hole. Uh, if you have a reamer, I you know do recommend reaming this hole. Just might as well make it accurate. It's a gauge, right? But if you don't, a drill will work just fine. The only important thing is to make sure that the central hole is sized appropriately for your taper so that it'll stick onto the stem. Second, uh, the really important thing about these is that they're accurate. So you can use that same six degree method that I used earlier in the video to really sneak up on that final dimension to make sure that these things come out accurate. Uh, and finally, this little section on the end here, remember that should be undersized by a couple of thousandths and that just helps when you're actually sizing a hole with these to get the gauge started in the hole if it's a really close fit. 
And that's basically it. And Shazam, that is all there is to it. I gotta tell you though, I am not loving the finish that I'm getting out of this mystery steel. It's acting a lot like that super low carbon, really gummy, nasty structural stuff. I have a suspicion that that's what it is. But we're already committed. We've come too far at this point. There's nothing left to do now, but I made a few more of them. So now I've got a full little set here from inch and an eighth at the largest size all the way down to a quarter of an inch on the stem in one eighth inch increments. And just a quick demonstration of how this works. You just take the gauge and push it onto that taper on the stem and it'll stick there. So now you can put the gauge down in a bore or whatever it is that you need to measure. You don't have to worry about it dropping down in there and you have this nice handle to hold on to. Admittedly, a pretty simple project, but a useful one too, I think. You do end up with a tool that you can use when you're through. And in my opinion, at least, it does provide good practice for those foundational skills. There is even a little bit of room for creativity. And hitting the dimensions on these gauges can be more challenging than you're expecting. Not to mention, if your lathe is out of alignment or needs to be leveled, a project like this will definitely sniff stuff like that out. So if you are looking for a project to do in your shop, like I mentioned, there will be a link to the drawings in the description. I highly encourage you to download a set and try it for yourself. And I know that it might be hard to believe, but I think that's all I have to say for now. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you again very soon.